Hello, this is Judge Dean Stout, and I'm uh, honored to be here today to uh, speak with you about uh, general concepts of the law, uh, systemic uh, issues. Uh, but I cannot speak about individual cases, nor can I give legal advice. And uh, I encourage you that if you have specific legal issues, to consult uh, with a licensed uh, attorney. Hello, this is Jimmy T. Welcome to Judgment Day with Judge Stout. Welcome, sir. Good morning. Did I pronounce your name correctly? You sure did. I appreciate your coming very, very much. And we ask you to be very gracious and explain some of the law to us. I'm more than happy to. And specifically, could you talk to us about criminal law? Certainly. Tell us about your background first. Well, um, I've been very fortunate and honored in my career to, when I started out in 1977, I served uh, as the Indio County Public Defender for about 10 years. And then I switched sides of the table and served as the assistant district attorney here at Indio for about 10 years. Uh, and that has served me well to see both sides of the table. Uh, and then uh, I served uh, a little over 21 years as the Indio County Superior Court judge, uh, originally as the sole judge, and then with uh, trial court unification, we became a, a two-judge court. Uh, I retired in the uh, middle of 2018, but haven't figured out retirement yet, and still working uh, in the Chief Justice's uh, assigned judges program where other courts uh, need assistance. And I work uh, significantly uh, in Sacramento County doing criminal cases there, um, also in Placer County and El Dorado County. And of course, I help out here in Inyo County uh, when needed. And of course, as you know, I'm also serving as the Bishop Pirate uh, Tribal Court Judge. So. I was very fortunate to have a pretty extensive background in criminal law and procedure. So, so you went from de defendant attorney to prosecuting attorney to judge. Is that a normal progression? Um, kind of like I think it's getting a little more common, but not so much. Um, some of the criticisms, depending on who the governor was, appointing uh, judges to fill vacancies. Uh, it was for a long time, and I, I kind of fit the profile of being this white guy with uh, a background in uh, prosecution in the DA's office. But uh, I think more and more people are seeing the value of, uh, as a judge, to understand the pressures and the considerations uh, of the attorneys on both sides of the council table. Uh, it certainly helped me immensely. And, Oftentimes in settling cases, you know, we're, uh, we're in the settlement business, not the litigation business. Uh, you know, um, we need to settle, frankly, one way or another, about over 98% of all cases that would otherwise be eligible to go to a jury trial. Uh, we're taxing our prospective juror pool already. And quite frankly, if we get up in that 99, or if we get less than that 98%, uh, the system can implode. You know, we don't have enough jurors. We don't have enough judges, courtrooms, and all the other infrastructure you need to administer justice. So, and we can talk a little bit about that settlement process here in a minute. But, um, and so to the extent that a judge has is experienced and has the kind of background and again, uh, as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney, uh, it can really help uh, get cases resolved, I think. And settlement does not mean that justice is not served. That's right. And we can Just... talk about that bad word plea bargain if you want. <laughs> you use the P word. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you give us an overview of adult criminal law in California? Yeah, procedures. we want to distinguish it from civil law. Civil law is generally when um, there might be an 
automobile accident or somebody suing uh, for negligence. It's usually an individual or an entity uh, suing someone else. Uh, it has a, a lower burden of proof usually. I'm being a little oversimplistic here, but the uh, criminal law and procedure we want to talk about here is really the people of the state of California is represented by the county district attorney or the state attorney general uh, bringing uh, charges against someone on behalf of the people of the state of California. And uh, again, it requires a much higher burden of proof than in civil cases. And, uh, and again, is there's uh, usually violations alleged of what our California penal code or if drugs are involved, health and safety code, the vehicle code. You know, we have many codes in California that have criminal penalties or sanctions that can be imposed if a person is uh, convicted. And I think it's important to realize in a criminal case that um, there is a right to a speedy and public trial by jury. Uh, and despite my comments about settlement, there, that is a right that we protect. And there are definitely cases, in my opinion, that do need to be tried. Um, so I, I don't want to mislead people <laughs> too much about that. It's a very important constitutional right. And again, in a criminal case, all 12 jurors have to in unanimously agree that the district attorney has met their burden of proof of proving the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's a very high standard. And uh, that comes into play when we talk about charging decisions and, and whether to drop charges or settle cases. Uh, People have to keep in mind there's complex rules of evidence that affect what uh, a prosecutor can prove or not prove, and uh, has to be satisfied that uh, they have sufficient admissible evidence to meet that high burden of proof, of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and convince all 12 jurors and unanimously <laughs> get a unanimous verdict. So when someone enters the legal system, mm -hmm. what is the first thing that happens? Well, oftentimes there's, you know, uh, uh, could be a 911 call, and there's law enforcement is generally involved early on. Um, they conduct investigations, make reports, and submit them to the district attorney's office. Um, now, we should talk about, well, how that is analyzed then by the district attorney's office. Okay. And they look at the evidence as we discuss, they realize, well, this is hearsay. How can I get this into evidence? Is there an exception to the hearsay rule? So forth. Uh, but they look at the credibility of their witnesses. They um, look at the totality of the evidence before them. Uh, and determine whether or not they think they can prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, sometimes uh, I'll ask law enforcement to go back and do some follow-up interviews or investigation, may want to wait for certain laboratory results to come in, which notwithstanding what you see on TV doesn't happen overnight or within seconds. Um, <laughs> Uh, they may find they don't have that evidence. They tried to lift fingerprints or get DNA or whatever. It's not there. So sometimes they have to wait for other evidence uh, to be produced. Uh, they Sometimes the district attorney's office has their own investigators who will work with the law enforcement agency to uh, go out and conduct a follow-up uh, investigation. Because often uh, some uh, attorney in the DA's office may say, well, uh, we're missing, we got to prove every element uh, of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, and we're missing something on the defendant's intent, for example. So can you see what evidence we could have there? Uh, and when I say prove every element of a crime, it's, it's kind of like... Uh, a recipe, and I don't bake, but I, 
Oh, well, but I know that you have to have flour to make a cake. And so there are certain uh, elements, if you will, of the recipe, and you've got to have all of them or you won't, quote, really have a cake. And it's the same with a crime. Um, you can, we can take burglary, for example. Uh, that's the entry, uh, unlawful entry into a building. And at the time of the entry, not later, but the time that defendant enters that building, um, the defendant has to have the intent to commit theft or a felony inside. So there has to be that concurrence of act and intent. Um, again, at the time of entry, and it may be an open business, but it's still unlawful to go in and steal. So um, a lot of times the DA may say, well, wait a minute, you know, they, they had cash in their pocket, they had a credit card, but then they got inside and the, I don't know if we have CDs anymore, but <laughs> the CDs went, to, went into the lady's purse and walked out with them. Well, did you really have the intent to commit theft at the time of entry or was that intent, assuming she just foolishly put them in her purse and forgot about them, but assuming that she did intend to steal them, was that intent formed after she got inside there she may not have any money checks or credit cards or debit cards on her that may suggest otherwise so um, again the district attorney has to prove every element of that offense beyond a reasonable doubt and if one is missing uh, the jury cannot unanimously find uh, they're guilty Does burglary still only happen at night, or has that changed? Because when I was in Law 101, they said burglary only happened after sunset. Um, that law has changed dramatically from the old English common law. It used to require a breaking and entering. Um, and we have different, uh, and now we have different offenses when uh, talking about, we have a different burglary statutes for commercial theft now. Um, the laws have changed dramatically. Uh, that's where TV can be a problem. Uh, yeah. It just gives people a false impression, and it's uh, far more complicated. And that's kind of what I need to say here ethically is, uh, as a judge, I cannot give legal advice. And um, a lot of what I'm saying uh, is subject to a lot more... Um, <laughs> Uh, complicated analysis by trained lawyers. And so I don't want people to try to apply what I'm saying here to any given case that may involve them or quote their friend. Um, I get that a lot. I have a friend who, you know, uh, so I, uh, please, uh, I don't want the audience to uh, take what I'm saying as uh, the in gospel my, or the. In my defense, my law book was printed on vellum. <laughs> so it was very, very old. So uh, once they've been in, so you said the district attorney has an investigation. Now, do they refer it to anybody? Or they act on it at that point. Well, again, the DA may have further investigation. Uh, sometimes they may feel that uh, they have to recuse themselves. They have a conflict of interest. And then another district attorney's office or the attorney general of California would come in and handle those cases. That's relatively rare. Um, and then they, if they're gonna file charges, sometimes it's by a citation, a misdemeanor traffic thing, or it can be by the filing of a criminal complaint, a misdemeanor or a felony. Generally a misdemeanor is punishable by up to a year in the county jail and uh, a felony by more than a year can be in state prison or the death penalty in a capital murder case. Um, so the DA decides what to charge um, and would file a complaint. The um, difference here in California with the federal system, we had a lot on TV recently about federal grand juries and indictments. and in the federal system, and it can technically still in California, 
a criminal charge can arise from a grand jury indictment. Um, the, and that's still prevalent in the federal system. So somebody may not even know they're being investigated or before the grand jury, and they don't know until a grand jury indictment or charge has uh, been rendered and they may be arrested or notified they need to come to court. In California, many years ago now, uh, it was determined that uh, that's not necessarily affording proper due process rights to a criminal defendant. Because, the, again, the defendant may not even know they're for a grand jury, uh, not represented by counsel, don't have the opportunity to confront and cross-examine the witnesses that are testifying to the grand jury or present their own evidence. Uh, so, California said, if the district attorney wants to proceed by criminal indictment, they can, but when the defendant appears in court, if they want to have a preliminary examination, they're entitled to it. And a preliminary hearing in a felony case is a hearing before a judge without a jury to determine if there's sufficient evidence, or we say reasonable and probable cause, to believe that the offense is charged in the complaint or in the other case, indictment, um, uh, have been committed and committed by that defendant. Uh, so uh, in California, having a criminal indictment and then still having to go through a preliminary examination is a practical matter, doesn't always make sense. Plus you have to be able to impanel a grand jury that's a representative cross-section of the community and uh, that can be somewhat challenging. Uh, there are cases, and from my own experience, where uh, a district attorney wasn't you know, can I prove this beyond a reasonable doubt? And so a way is to take that to the grand jury or a paneled criminal grand jury. Um, and there were even times when I was public defender when the district attorney uh, informed me they were looking at a criminal indictment. And uh, I arranged to uh, in that couple cases, um, trusted the that process. Usually people say it's, it's totally unfair because all they're hearing is what the DA wants to tell them. Uh, and that's not to say they're not doing so fully and ethically and properly. They, they do, in my opinion. But the, um, I should caveat on that, but the, um, I cooperated and uh, gave the DA the evidence that I had and, uh, and trusted him to present it fairly to the grand jury. And in both those cases, they did not return an indictment. Uh, there are other cases where uh, they may have a major drug investigation going on with a lot of subjects. So there's reasons why to get criminal indictments so they don't compromise the investigation of others, delay the arrests until they've indicted everybody that they can. And then, so it's a tool on occasion not to compromise uh, an ongoing or expansive uh, criminal investigation. But generally now what happens is um, they file a felony complaint. The person uh, is either arrested or noticed to come to court. Uh, and there's what's called an arraignment proceeding. That's usually the initial hearing where the uh, defendant is advised of the nature of the charges and the complaint, make sure they at least understand the general nature of them. Um, that they're informed of their legal and constitutional rights and 
making sure that an attorney is appointed to represent them if they're indigent and don't have their own uh, private defense attorney. And then uh, if they're in custody, there's considerations about uh, bail or release on their own recognizance for their promise to appear and then setting further uh, board proceedings in that case. Uh, going back a minute on the grand jury, I, I think it's important to understand that in Inyo County and in many California uh, counties at the present time, we have civil grand jurors uh, as distinct from a criminal grand jury. Uh, I learned this early on. My uh, late grandmother was uh, served two terms on the Los Angeles County grand jury and happened to, uh, they were doing criminal indictments at that time, and she was on the grand jury that indicted Charles Manson. Um, and so very early on, I started getting an education about grand juries well before I was even dreaming about going to law school. Um, and so, the, again, a criminal grand jury has to be representative, like in a jury trial. We question, we call it the voir dire process. We question prospective jurors, uh, and we get a pool of grand jurors that's, I'm sorry, jurors that are hopefully a representative cross-section of the community. Um, in getting our grand, our civil grand jury, sometimes that's pretty hard to do. Um, you know, we got a lot of people that have, they got to work, they got obligations, family, you know, it's just, it's hard to dedicate, you know, a year to being on a civil grand jury. But they're an oversight body that um, looks into uh, local uh, government. You know, basically, uh, I think their mere existence uh, is a deterrent to any misconduct or embezzlement. And hopefully they don't find some, but if they do, then there are steps to address that. Uh, but a lot of what they're doing is investigating state and local agencies or districts. And uh, I've always said they can be a valuable tool to uh, not only file a report that may be critical of the way things are being done, that they might be able to be done more effectively or uh, efficiently, but to also complement uh, departments that they think are doing a good job, um, but maybe need more resources to even do it the way they would like to. When I was a uh, presiding judge, I always encouraged the grand jurors to uh, initially meet with every elected official or department head. Understand what they do, what they can do and not do. Uh, hear from them where they think they have issues. Because when county budget time comes around, if I were head of the road department and people are complaining about the potholes that I don't have the resources to fill, I'd like to take that grand jury report to the Board of Supervisors and say, hey, I'd need a bigger piece of the pie. Um, so they can, you know, point out uh, processes that are going on in various departments that are uh, efficient, effective, and maybe can be replicated uh, by other agencies. Uh, so, but again, the civil grand jury is uh, generally, we say, uh, an oversight of uh, local government, and I'm being a little bit oversimplified, and a bit, uh, criminal grand jury uh, now would be specially uh, impaneled uh, just to hear the one indictment case and going through a similar process we would with a criminal jury selection to ensure hopefully we have a representative cross-section of the community and people that can be fair and impartial. So both of these juries have a representative of the community? They're uh, selected from the community. Okay. Um, you know, on the grand jury, I'm looking for, or was in the past, um, folks from different social, economic walks of life, uh, racial, uh, diversity, geographic diversity, trying to get people from, you know, down in... Uh, from Darwin to... 
rollers, yeah, and all the way down to uh, death below Death Valley. Um, and, you know, I try to get age and different, uh, you know, walks of life. Uh, the grand jury can choose what to look into and something they act upon sometimes anonymous or other information they receive or maybe what was left undone by a prior grand jury. But they have a lot of discretion in terms of what they want to investigate. But you may have a grand juror who has a background in, um, you know, maintenance, worked for Caltrans or worked uh, heavy equipment. You may have a physician. You can have some insights into how to conduct look into, say, the county health department. But you have people with different backgrounds, education, training, and experience. And if you have a diversity of that, I think it just enhances the scope of what the grand jury can do. And it's not to say that that one person who may be more of an expert in that area calls the shots. That's not what we want. And we don't want people in the grand jury that have this hidden agenda. You know, um, yes, that that's not doing justice here, and uh, so I've, I've gotten way off our topic here. But no I see a book tour in my future. Let me be on the grand jury. Yeah, so, yeah, and I encourage people to do so. You make uh, valuable friendships that last. Um, it's rewarding. It's very important to uh, ensuring the quality, if you will, of our local government. Um, you know, and I, I again, I, I tell department heads, don't be threatened by the grand jury. They, they can be a tool to really help you. Um, and I've had people that serve for multiple years as four person, and they've seen the value in it. Some get frustrated because when they file reports or their final report, it does not have to be followed. You know, the county, city, district, um, may put it on the shelf but i think if nothing else the discussion uh, that comes from that grand jury report is beneficial and i've seen in many cases the recommendation of the grand jury is uh, adopted or whole or in part or sometimes it may be a year or two later and that's dusted off and they go yeah that grand jury had it right we need to change these things so uh it it shouldn't be frustrating, but it's a valuable uh, service. So, if the grand jury do they pass an indictment, what is the procedure when they find okay, there's well, if they do a criminal indictment, um, it's much like the district attorney just filing a felony criminal complaint. Uh, they come to court either in custody or not on the uh, criminal indictment. But again, in when a felony complaint is filed. Uh, one of the rights uh, that the defendant has uh, is to a speedy and public preliminary examination, or we call it preliminary hearing, again, before a court without a jury to determine if there's sufficient evidence to order the defendant to stand trial, and his right to a jury trial. Um, if there's, uh, and there's, there's time limits on that, if a defendant is in custody, uh, they have the right to a preliminary examination within 10 court days or in any event uh, within 60 calendar days. Sometimes they'll waive those rights on the advice of counsel to have more time to prepare for different reasons. Thank mm -hmm. you.